Hey, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming back to my channel. A few short minutes of the pod. I am your host, Stacey Short, and today I've got a special guest. Her name is Anne Robinson. Now, Anne is a licensed uh, clinic clinical social worker and burnout coach. She is wildly passionate about supporting women in the, to be their best selves. And with her help, you'll feel empowered to find clarity in your wants, needs, and thoughts. And through all of that, she'll help you build up from your current situation, blow the dust off of your goals uh, to prove that you are a, you, they are more attainable than you think. Oh, my brain just stopped. You guys know how that is. Oh, well. Anyway, hi, Anne. Welcome. Introduce yourself. Hi, Stacy. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Anne Robinson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Colorado, but I work with folks all over the country as a coach and with people in Colorado as a therapist. Amazing. Amazing. I'm super How long have you been a therapist? Today. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. Yeah, I've been practicing. I've been practicing as a social worker since 2010. I've been a therapist since 2019. Awesome. Fantastic. And yeah, what do you like about being a social worker therapist just in that general space of, of help? Yeah. So I've always been drawn to kind of helping professions. I think folks that are our coaches, social workers, counselors, therapists typically are, uh, they come from this as a child and as a teenager of like being the person that people go to for help or support, being a really good Facts. listener. Um, yeah. And so that was, that's part of my origin story too. Um, and I, I love being a social worker because I think it's really like dynamic. It gives me a lot of opportunity to work in a bunch of different fields and try new things. Um, and I love coaching people too, because it gives me the opportunity to reach a broader audience than I would just as a, if I were just working where I was licensed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I say when people are like, how long have you been coaching? Uh, all my life. <laughs> all my right. life. Because I remember in middle school being the the friend, yes. the advice friend. Yes. And so I've been doing yes. this unprofessionally and off the cuff for as long as I can remember. And, um, you know, professionally yeah. for almost four years now. Uh, so, yeah, it is. Yeah. That is definitely the origin story of, of most uh, people in this in these professions of like. I've always mm -hmm. been the one. I've always been the one, which is such an honor. It's such an honor. Uh, it's a lot to handle sometimes. Yeah. But it is an honor. Yeah. Uh -huh. sure. Yeah, um, it can be a lot to handle, right? Because I think it also happens for people who are like nurses, people who are teachers, people who um, like just want to help in general, which it can be really overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I see us not taking care of ourselves uh, because of that. So uh, yes. I'm really, I'm really um, present to that fact. Uh, in your coaching yeah. practice, who do you help? Yeah, so I typically work with women. Um, most specifically, I work with kind of millennials, Gen X folks who are in helping professions and are find themselves kind of in there too deep and need to dig back out and rediscover who they are and that they have likes and preferences and wants and goals that don't just revolve around like making the people around them happy. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. Mm -hmm. And um, talk about some of the modalities and techniques and so on and so forth that you do to help profession professionals like me who I mean, I am yeah. a coach, but you can yeah. sometimes get lost in that coach oh, and yeah. never put it down, right? That coach hat and never take it off. So what are some of the things that you use modalities, techniques to help people like me take off that hat and put it down for a second? Yeah. So I, first of all, I think I honor that it takes an act of trust to put down the hat because when we are in these kinds of professions, they become part of our identity and putting that down feels really hard and feels really unsafe because it becomes a bit of an armor that keeps us feeling protected. So I like to honor that first. I also um, love to use 
some different inventories to help people kind of get back connected to what matters to them and what their values are. I'm also really passionate about bringing skills into sessions. So like giving people tangible things that they can use immediately and they can practice and um, it builds a lot of like quick, easy wins and successes that keeps people feeling brave enough to keep trying more, right? Like that that's the momentum that we're always looking for is like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm willing to give it a try. And oh, look, that worked. So let me try this other thing and see if that works too. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of scaffolding. So it really depends on the individual and where they're foundational knowledge is and their certain situations are and their circumstances. And we build on people's strengths and skills that they naturally bring to the table. Uh, and really like, how do we enhance this so that you live a life that you're like super excited about? Yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, you are so right about the quick wins, right? The quick wins uh, yeah. keep get our momentum. It keeps it going. And um, there's a lot of power in quick wins. So uh, if you guys are struggling to do some sort of habit change or break something, um, mm -hmm. do something that's easy that you'll yeah. get a quick win right. on, you know, first yeah. and then and then do something else that's easy, but maybe a little step ahead and step above and yeah. step above until you can get to that hard yeah. part of like, OK, let me let this go completely. Um, it is hard to get there, but it can be done. It, it can is. be done for yeah. sure. Um, what's one of the little quick win modalities or techniques that you like to uh, encourage somebody to, to to try first? Yeah, so my my all time favorite, and I think this is there's a little bit of self disclosure here. It's one of my favorites because it's something that like I use a lot or I think about using a lot because let's be honest, like we all, don't always do what we know we're supposed to do, um, and it's truth. a tool. <laughs> it's a tool called opposite action, which is this idea that I have a tendency or an urge or my relationship dynamics are set up as such where this is what I typically do. So my boss asks me to work late or to pick up an extra shift because someone's on leave or someone's sick. My immediate answer is to say, yep, sure, no problem. I'm part of the team. I'm a helper. And knowing that that has a ripple effect on my personal life, my relationships, my exhaustion, my burnout. And so the opposite action would be to wait, to really evaluate what the consequences are, and then to respond. So this yeah. is like, that's a relational situation or a professional situation, but it could be something as simple as like, I really don't want to get in the shower today. Like, I don't want to take a shower. I don't want to deal with like drying my hair. I feel that on like a really deep level. And I also know that getting in the shower is going to make me feel a little bit better. So I'm going to go ahead and get in the shower. So it can be like really little things or it can be big relational things. Yeah. I love that. Um, I was recently diagnosed with ADHD, which my boys have been diagnosed for a long time. So why I thought I was going to escape, I don't know. But um, uh, what I know to be true is that that ADHD of paralysis that happens of like mm -hmm. showering some days feels like so big because neurotypicals just go, oh, I'm just going to pop in and out of the shower. The neurodivergents go, I have to get undressed. I have to wait for the water to get warm. Then I got to get in. Then I got to wash the parts. Then I got to shave the parts. Then I got to wash my hair. Then I've got to condition my hair. Then I've got to, you know, and it just is like, oh my God, this is too much. I just can't. I just can't. And so you yeah. get frozen. Right. And it, it, yeah. Yeah. It's legit. It's uh, that I didn't realize that that was an actual thing until I started learning more about ADHD paralysis and I was like, holy crap, that makes so much sense. <laughs> makes so much sense. Yeah. So, yeah. So along that line, there's another tool that I like to offer to people too, which is when you struggle with task initiation, which is what you're talking about, right? Of like getting started on something just feels so like freaking hard. I don't know if we can curse on this show. Um, uh, yeah, but it care. feels so big and hard that I can't even bring myself to get started. Right. And so one of the, one of the techniques that can be helpful in those situations of giving yourself permission to just do five minutes. And if you still hate it at the end of the five minutes, you can stop. 
And if you want to keep going at the end of the five minutes, you can keep going. But we're going to do five minutes and just doing five minutes counts. Yeah. And I think for, for me, um, ex-people pleaser, grew up in a codependent household, perfectionistic pattern. For me, the hard part is at the end of five minutes, if I choose to stop, not beating the crap out of myself mentally because I chose to stop. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. that's something that I've worked on for many, many, many years. And that's why yeah. my coaching practice circles a lot around negative self-talk because that has been one of yeah. my biggest life wins is reducing mm -hmm. that negative self-talk by somewhere around 75%. And, um, because that's what I would, that, that's naturally what I would do. I would like beat myself yeah. into doing the other, the other half of the stove, the other five minutes, the other, you know what I mean? Until it was done and not allow myself that, that rest, that grace, that space. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. And so sometimes it can be helpful to like set up those expectations ahead of time. Like it's okay if I only do five minutes, right? Like I've already cleared it with myself. I know like all of my parts are on board. Everything's okay. Five minutes counts as a win. And also like that partnered with lots of self-compassion, which is what you're talking about, right? If like, I'm still good, even though I only did five minutes even if I wanted to do 40. Yeah, I think it's that, that's that grace that is so difficult for a lot of people of like, yeah. no, it, it really is okay. I'm not lazy. Yeah. I'm not, you know, a piece mm -hmm. of shit. I'm not uh, a bad mom. I'm not, um, you know, I talked to a lot of moms who, it just happened with a client. I was like, I, I tried to schedule with her uh, for this weekend. Cause I'm going to show her some YouTube stuff and like, she wants to start a yeah. channel. So, all right, I'll just show you like nothing professional, not a professional appointment. I was just trying to set up a personal appointment with her. And I was like, uh, how's Friday. She's like concert. I'm like, okay, how's Saturday. She's like, Oh no, I, I have two practices, a birthday party, a blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, girlfriend, where are you in any of this? You know, I'm like, well, what about mm -hmm. Sunday? Oh, no, I've got a retreat that I'm um, not hosting, but like working at. And I was like, you also work seven, like five days a week, <laughs> like stuff, like eight, nine hours a day. Like, girlfriend, where are you in all of this? Yeah. And that's what I. We don't have you know, time for a YouTube channel. <laughs> And we don't give ourselves the self-compassion to say it is okay if I don't mm -hmm. go to my my son's practice. That's it is right. okay if I ask my partner to take them to the birthday and I don't go. Mm -hmm. It is okay. Mm -hmm. But we just feel mm -hmm. like the immediate I'm a bad mom, me putting myself first, that selfish, um, you know, and all of that fun stuff, which is why my niche statement um, is I help women who are struggling with exhaustion indecisiveness and loss of identity due to yeah. putting everybody else ahead of yeah. themselves because that's oh. pretty much you know the american mom the american woman standard uh whether you're a mom yeah or not. yeah have you read the book called fair play no sounds like i need to it's though. by yeah it's by eve her, her last name starts with an R. I can look it up okay. and tell you in a minute. But um, she writes about, it's really like focused on hetero couples or like gender roles that are hetero in couples and how women tend to look at their time as infinite, meaning that like, you just keep giving me more and I'll make it work. I'll figure it out. And men look at their time as finite and worthy of protecting. Where they're like really ready to say, I don't have time for that. I can't do that. And women are like, if you're asking me, it is my job to figure it out and make it work. Right. And this is what you're talking about here of like, what would change for us if we looked at our time as finite? And instead of saying like, I'll figure it out and make it work. I said, I don't have time for this right now, actually. Yeah. I wish I did, but I don't. So I need to move some stuff around in order to make time instead of just like add it into the end of my day or the beginning of my day. Yeah, absolutely. The number of women that I talk to on a daily basis who stay up till one, two, three in the morning uh, to mm -hmm. get that quiet time is just 
amazing and they wonder why they can't function during the day or they're relying on caffeine to to plow through because they're only getting you know four or five hours a, at night because they yeah. they are trying to reclaim that time um but instead of putting boundaries and and having you know that finite view on time they just take it from themselves later which just is not mm-hmm. healthy mm-hmm. at all um talk yeah. about how they call it like per- procrastination ahead, insomnia. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They call it oh. procrastination insomnia when I have like no time to myself. And then I just like my nervous system needs time to decompress. So it means that I don't sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's bad enough when you have bouts of insomnia, but then when you purposefully mm-hmm. do the procrastination, um, the, then you're just robbing it even more so. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. and the same thing with ener- energy too. Energy is finite. And yet we act like it's that's not. Right. We act like it's not, you know, oh, that's okay. Bandwidth. What, who is she? Don't know her. Just bring it on. Just bring it on. But your energy is finite too. And we don't protect it at all ever. Mm-hmm. And that means not only like giving of it, but protecting it and of who is taking from it as well, who, who you're around, who you give your energy, your time, your space to um, is really important as well, as well, for sure. Yeah. Talk about burnout. I think there's, yeah, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. I think um, I've got a little lag on my internet connection, so I apologize. Um, Yeah. I think burnout is, is a component of this, right? And like this idea that I need to be available to everyone at all times and still then feel guilty for not like taking care of myself as if I'm creating, oh, that's fun. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> that is fun. That, yeah, Perfect I don't timing. know that, but, right. Um, but not taking care of myself while I'm supposed to also take care of other people, right? Again, this idea that our bandwidth is infinite, like our time is infinite. And what that leads to is is burnout and compassion fatigue, which is like, I don't care about the things that I used to care about. I can't bring myself to care about my work. I can't bring myself to care about my relationships. I feel really frustrated and irritated by things that really shouldn't bother me that much. Because it's a response in our body that's telling us, like, you got too much going on. Like, we need to pare it down a little bit. Yeah, talk a little bit more about the symptoms of burnout and compassion fatigue. Because I don't know that the general public has an idea of they're yeah. they're actually experiencing these things. For sure. So I, when I talk about burnout, I love to talk about the symptoms that I would call like yellow light symptoms. So if we're thinking about a stoplight, right, yellow is our proceed with caution, right? Of like this, we shouldn't like go full bore, but we also maybe shouldn't stop right away. And the yellow light signs are things like um, I'm skipping lunch or I'm not making time to eat during the day. There are things like I'm staying up late watching stupid television that I don't actually care about and kind of like zoning out, numbing out. There are things like I'm spending way more time on social media, just scrolling, 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 because it's like one of the few calming activities I have available to me. It could be things like I used to really prioritize seeing friends or going to this yoga class and I haven't been in three or four months. It could be things like... um, I don't feel like showering anymore, right? Kind of like not necessarily problematic, but things that like wouldn't, you're not living your best self. You're not like showing up excited and enthusiastic for your day. Um, This is when like your to-do list gets a mile long and you just keep adding more things to it instead of really strategizing how to get to the next thing. Um, And I think these are really relatable to a lot of us because the expectations that we hold for ourselves are far higher than anyone would ever put on us as expectations. Oh, 1000%. 
1000 <laughs> percent yeah and i i don't like to kind of like dump out a bunch of symptoms knowing that people are thinking about this and being like oh shit right like this she's call she's got my number without giving them something to do about it yeah. right and i think when we are in that spot where we're like this isn't going well but i also don't really know what to do some of the strategies that i suggest are um like really looking at your calendar and getting ruthless with like, do I really need to be there? Can I give this to someone else? Like make your days coming up as easy as possible, right? And seeing that as like, this is temporary. This is not a sign you can't handle it. This is an investment so that you can continue showing up in your life in the spaces that matter. So that's the, the first strategy that I suggest. The second strategy is like, tell your people, right? Because the thing about burnout and compassion fatigue is that we feel really guilty about it. We feel really ashamed about it. Like I shouldn't feel this way. I shouldn't be so impacted. Um, and so this is when we use that opposite action skill instead of isolating and withdrawing, I'm going to lean in and let people know that I'm kind of struggling right now and not because I'm looking for solutions, but because I'm going to bring, I know that these people are trustworthy and I'm going to bring them in, in this time that I know that I'm having a hard time. Um, the third strategy is really like focusing on the, the basic needs. So focusing on what you're eating and how often you're eating, drinking water, um, getting some movement into your day. So even if it's just kind of walking around outside of your office building or walking around your block, getting outside is really important, uh, and prioritizing your sleep. So even if it's like, I need to retrain my body to get back into the habit and going to bed at an hour that gives me enough rest so that I can do my day more effectively. Um, because I've brought in other supports to take some stuff off my table, my plate temporarily. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. Thank you. Because I think a lot of times we do see ourselves called out in a meme or, you know, a mm -hmm. podcast or whatever. And then we're like, well, shit, I don't know what to do about that then. Like, thanks for, right. uh, yeah, I'm right there, but where's the solution? And, and for most people, yeah. you know, the solution's like, we'll just stop. Well, that's not, it's not really the solution. Like, that's not, that's not viable. Right. You can't just stop. Right. Yeah. You can't just stop. Um, what is something that you like to do for you? I like to garden. I like to read. I like to hang out with my family and my pets. I, um, as someone who's also a, like a little neuro spicy, I get on these like hobby highways where I pick something I'm super excited about and then I like really dive into it. That's really fun and shows up in a lot of different ways in my life um, and might be a little frustrating to my husband. But this is how I got this podcast, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how this podcast yeah. came to be. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and so I think that shows up sometimes it might show up in like arts and crafts or like knitting, crocheting, needlepoint. It might show up as like woodworking or building. It might show up as, um, I, you know, I don't know, graphic design. I'll like get really into like Canva or this is also when I like professionally build new programs where I'm like, oh, this sounds really cool. I'm going to build this right now. Um, so yeah, those are all the things that I do to take care of myself. I love it. I love it so much. Yeah. That's a, that's how this podcast started. That's how this YouTube channel started. It was just one weekend when I was too bored and this is what happens mm -hmm. when, when you're yeah. neuro spicy and you've got some downtime, you're like, that's okay. Okay. Nope. Nope. Got to do something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't sit still very well. Uh, but when I sit still, I'm a rock. So, mm -hmm. you know, you got to love that the neurodivergence uh, there. It's so funny. It's definitely uh, so I was late diagnosed just a couple of months ago, but it's made so much sense looking backwards. And it's like, man, I wish I had had that this label earlier because I, yes, 
I look back and I go, oh yeah, absolutely. This makes sense now. Um, but man, I used to beat the beat the shit out of myself for yeah. all of these things. Now that I'm like, oh, that's ADHD. Okay. But, and just kind of move along. Right. Um, but I was so mm-hmm. difficult on myself. So like more than anybody, obviously, right. We're the, we're our own worst enemies. Mm-hmm. And, um, but yeah, having this label has been like so freeing of like, oh, all right. Okay. Well, I love ADHD. Yeah. I think it's like partially the label, but it's also like permission to be yourself. Right. Sure. And, and for like the universe is saying to you like, oh yeah, this makes sense that this is a struggle for you. And who doesn't want that kind of validation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the podcast that I recorded previously, just earlier today, we talked about unmasking. We talked about performative, you know, being performative. And because I spent most of my life masked and performing for everybody. And so now when I'm not masking people, my old friends are like, are you okay? Are you good? You don't seem okay. And I'm like, no, bro, I'm good. And they're like, you're not smiling. Like, are you all right? Like, no, I'm just, I'm just dropped the mask. I don't feel the need to to be performative now. So you'll like me. And and I spent Mm -hmm. a million years doing that. And that is exhausting. Mm -hmm. That That is is exhausting on top of everything yeah. else, right? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, talk about the mental load. That's been a conversation that I've had a lot lately about especially women carrying mental loads. Yeah. And wh- how do you see that contributing yeah. to burnout? Mm. I think it's a huge contributor to burnout, right? And that when we talk about mental loads, we're thinking about all of the things that we are responsible for, but then also all of the the things that are happening around us and the other worries and preoccupations that people around us have. So that could be on like a really micro level, like just the people I'm interacting with on a day-to-day basis or my family members, people I live with, or it could be on a macro level on like I'm really impacted by what's happening in Israel right now or I'm really impacted by like something that's happening in a different part of the country or a different part of the world. And that is exhausting, right? And it's natural. It's part of our experience on this planet. But back to your comment about bandwidth is that, and and self-criticism, we expect that impact to not play a role in our functioning in other aspects of our life. Like we expect to just be like business as usual and not even business as usual, but like a business better than ever before, or it's a failure. Yeah. That extreme of like either you're perfect or you're shit. There's no in between. Mm -hmm. There's no in between. Um, Do you see a a difference in, the carrying of mental load between, between, I, I understand like genders, right? Ma- yeah, men yeah. and women, not to leave the they's and the haze out, my friends, not at all, but talking heteronormative here. Um, sure. Do you see a difference in the mental load, how pe- how they carry it versus us? Yeah, for sure. Again, I think it's about, um, there's a lot that contributes to mental load when it comes to power and privilege. So when we're when people are walking through the world feeling like they belong where they're supposed to be there's less of a responsibility to pick up whatever's left over and so that could be when we talk about power and privilege we're often talking about white men but the entire spectrum of the spaces that we're in and the entire spectrum of identity and gender comes with like how how like how much agency do I feel in the spaces that I'm operating within right do I feel like I belong do I feel like I'm deserving of respect do I feel like other people can join me in this mental load that I'm carrying or do I feel responsible for masking and making others feel really comfortable with who I am oh, and yeah, so I think anybody so who 
anybody who's who's sitting in a space where like they're not feeling that belonging or that entitlement is going to carry a heavier men mental load. I never I never thought of it from that angle. So thank you so much. That absolutely yeah. makes sense because you're like, nope, I got to perform harder, faster, stronger. So you guys will like yeah. me. So you'll accept me, you know, so you that's don't right. uh, abandon me. And, and that's been, you know, a lot of most of my life is worrying, uh, performing so I wouldn't be abandoned. Um, you know, working on that, been in therapy nine years. Yeah. I talk about it, uh, my abandonment wound. I, I talk about it with friends and clients um, because I feel like these kind of authentic uh, conversations have to happen in mm -hmm. order for us to heal collectively and singularly. Um, and the only way we're going to have it is if people are brave enough to say, yeah, I've got an abandonment wound and this is how I know it shows up. Yeah. And this is why I've done these behaviors yeah. or had these relationships previously because I was looking for that external validation of like, yeah, Stacey, you're worth it. You matter. You belong here. We love you. Um, and I didn't need to do any of that. That's right. I didn't need to do any of it. That's right. um, yeah. But that is definitely not what I told myself. And um, I think it's just fascinating how my behaviors, like I'm still looking back, you know, you have new lenses all the time and I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and and it's wild. like you can say you didn't need to do that, but every fiber in your being felt like it was a survival skill. Like it oh, felt no, I really necessary. Had to do it. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. I absolutely had to do it because if I don't take it on, um, somebody else will. And then this is where the perfectionism comes in is if somebody else does it, it's not going to be right. And so I might as well just take yeah. it on because I know I'll do it the right way. Um, and thanks mom for that. Thank you mom for that. Um, <laughs> that's exactly where it came from. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. And, and, and give my mom grace. She did the best she could with what she had and what mm -hmm. she knew. And, and I know that, um, but man, when you, when you get some healing in you and you get some distance, you're like, oh my gosh, wow, wow. The epiphanies that I've had in the last few years, the little light bulbs that have come on have been innumerable and um, so healing and so normalizing and so mm -hmm. hard, <laughs> right? Yeah. Healing is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Talk about it's it, do you it makes sense why yeah, people please. don't do it, right? Like because it is such a heavy lift. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's this other mental load that comes in with it of like, well, now I have a choice. Mm -hmm. Because I can't unknow what I know now. So I can't go back into the blissful ignorance and in, in repeating the patterns and living on autopilot, but man, it was easier there, easier, mm -hmm. right? The, the operative word there. And um, yeah. so then I have a choice, go back intentionally or go forward intentionally. And either one is mm -hmm. scary. It's all scary. It's all scary. Um. What is your favorite thing about being a helper? Hmm. 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 That's a great question. I, it's so funny because oftentimes, like, I don't know if you share this, but I think about, I think about this work as kind of a calling. Like there's, it's hard to imagine that I would do anything else. Um, but I don't often spend a lot of time thinking about like what I like about it. But the first thing that comes to mind is I love building meaningful relationships with people that feel really like, special and sacred. I think offering women the chance to have a like a safe and stable professional relationship with someone can bring so much healing to their other relationships and being being part of that origin story is really exciting yeah that's my favorite thing is it's such an honor 
to for people to trust me and actually get vulnerable with me um, and allow me yeah. to see inside the scary box. I don't take yeah. that lightly ever, ever. It's such an honor no. um, because I know it's not easy to do. Gift. No, it really, really is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really is. And you open up Pandora's box and you're like, no, come in, come look mm -hmm. in here. Look what I have. And then, then, you know, you're like, oh God, please still like me. <laughs> please still like me. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but I also think the the power that we have to normalize the human experience Right. Because this is what I see coaching and therapy is, is a chance for us to kind of like pitch our experiences and our beliefs and our values to someone else and say, is this typical or is this not typical? Yeah. And yeah, for sure. Helping people kind of like recalibrate is great. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I like that. It definitely is a recalibration, you know, every time I have therapy and, um, and I feel more like myself after every session, yeah. even if it's a hard session, at least I know I showed up for myself. And that, yeah. that is the way to start really building self-care and self-trust is showing up for yourself, yeah. even if it's for an hour a week in some sort of therapeutic coaching relationship. Yeah. Um, even if you just do a course yeah. online with no live person or whatever, yeah. but committing to something that is just for you, it, it, it builds a great foundation for, like you were saying earlier, scaffolding. That's a great foundation to scaffold mm -hmm. from for sure. Mm -hmm. So with that, talk about your program. Yeah. So I have a, um, a coaching program called filling your cup first, which which is a, a six month program. It's like a high touch hybrid coaching program. So there's a lot of on demand videos and resources for folks to work through, but then there's also built in other supports. Like there's a private Facebook group with extra resources and live Q and A's on a regular basis, as well as one-to-one -one opportunities with me to really, um, bring some of these ideas and uh, offerings that I have to life in your life. So it's something that I did in my therapy practice for about a year and a half and was like, holy crap, like people are making really amazing leaps and bounds in their, their, their personal growth and their professional growth with this material. And so that was kind of the inspiration to launch it into a, a coaching program. I love that so much. I love that so much. And y'all, yeah. I don't know if you see her URL is life in sync. So wherever my crazy millennials are just waiting for that announcement, uh, this is your sign to go find Anne because <laughs> in sync. I'm just saying that was not lost on me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not lost on me. Um, and thank you so much for being here today. Tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah. So I am, my website is annrobinsonlcsw.com. I can be found on Instagram with the handle Ann Robinson coaching and I, my free Facebook group that's open to anyone is life and sync. So you can find me there and there is a boatload of free resources available and support. I do weekly live trainings in there on topics that are of interest to participants and would love to see you there, but you can find more information about my paid offer on my website. Fantastic. Thank you so much, you guys. I don't know why you would miss it scrolling across the screen, but in case you did, it's in the description below. Um, if this, if you've seen yourself at some point today, go check out Anne. If you've resonated with any part of this today, go check out Anne because um, you're not alone. You're not crazy. No. This is real and there is help. And that's the beautiful thing about any of this. Yeah. And so thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here, friends, and giving me your time and your energy and your space. I do not take that for granted. Um, I want you guys to be where your feet are. And I love you, friends. I'll see you next time.